right. It is counting down now. Five, four, three, two, one. To our start time. So let's go, shall we? I'm David Stone from I Fearless, and we are tonight going to be talking about overcoming masculine anxiety. You know that term, masculine anxiety, right in itself, that almost seems like a like an oxymoron, doesn't it? Because uh, men aren't supposed to be anxious. Men are supposed to be strong, the strong, silent type. We can do anything. Uh, we're uh, nothing scares us. Nothing. We're not afraid. You know who is it that uh, that the kids run to when they're scared? Uh, you know, well, dad's the one that they know will protect them. Well, turns out that a lot of this bottles up inside dad, and whether you're a dad or not, inside men. And we want to talk about that tonight. And what we want to talk about is ways to deal with that, and ways to overcome it as well. Ways to let go of the worries, the anxieties, the self-doubts that all of us suffer, but men suffer in a particular way. And I want to talk about some unique facts about anxiety in men. Uh, anxiety and men. And statistics show that about one in five men will uh, experience some kind of anxiety disorder during their life. Now that compares with about one in three for women who will experience some kind of anxiety disorder. However, uh, we need to note that the people that study this sort of thing, the psychologists, are very concerned that that one in five number does not in fact reflect the reality, that these are, numbers are very unreported. And we're going to get into that whole social conditioning thing that says men aren't allowed to talk about anxiety. We're not allowed to feel anxiety. We're certainly not allowed to go looking for help for it as well. So those numbers, those one in five, I mean, that's 20%. Look around, see five men, one of them uh, officially is, has suffered some kind or will suffer some kind of anxiety disorder in his life. And we want to deal with that. Now, the other thing about that we hear from psychologists is that the rates of seeking help for that, um, the rates of treatment seeking are very low across the board, but even lower with men. Men do not go looking for help. They don't go looking for directions and they don't go looking for help with their anxiety either. And that's not good. You know, if you broke your arm, you'd go looking for somebody to help you fix that. If you uh, came down with some kind of a terrible bug, coronavirus, you'd go looking for help with that. Anxiety is, is the same kind of uh, trouble that we've got, but we tend not to go looking for help with that. Now, the problem is, for men specifically, the anxiety is still there. And for men, it tends to show up in different ways. Because we don't, because we're not allowed to, not encouraged to, let it out and to talk about it to others, it's still inside and you can think of it inside like a pressure, inside a kettle. Eventually it's going to come out and for men it comes out in different ways. Now, low-grade anxieties tend to show up as headaches, they show difficulty sleeping, muscle aches, uh, you know, various sort of um, uh, mysterious pains that we might feel. And you go to the doctor and say, Doc, my, you know, my jaw's hurting, my shoulders are hurting. And the doctor looks and he can't find anything wrong at all. And in fact, what's happening is we're just, we've got so much anxiety, so much stress and tension inside ourselves that we're holding ourselves tight and those muscles are literally becoming sore from the effort of doing that. Or it shows up with stomach aches or it shows up with headaches. There's all kinds of ways. And that's what men are more likely to do, to experience when in fact the underlying disorder is anxiety. Now, those are the mild cases, all right? As the anxiety gets, uh, gets more intense, men are much more likely to uh, use different uh, coping strategies and destructive coping strategies. Uh, alcohol use, um, alcohol and drugs. You know, what might look like a drinking problem in a particular man might in fact be an underlying anxiety disorder and it shows up 
as a drinking problem or a, uh, some other substance abuse problem. Uh, and the, the problem is, or the challenge is, that aggression uh, tends to be a much more socially acceptable means of coping for men than it does for women. Uh, men are encouraged to be aggressive. We're masculine. We're strong. And so when our anxiety comes out and we end up kicking the dog or, unfortunately, beating a wife or, or somebody else, uh, that's way, way too common in men. Now, when it gets really uh, out of hand, the, uh, the death rate from suicide in men is consistently three and a half to four times higher than it is for women. So men have all this anxiety, all this stress, all this um, self-doubt and worry bottled up inside them. They can't turn to anybody for help with it. it. It grows and it grows and they reach a point of hopelessness and they believe that the only way out is through suicide. And the rates of suicide, as I said, three and a half to four times higher for men than they are for women. And, and that's, a, that's a serious, serious problem. Uh, alcoholism is consistently twice as high in men than it is for women. Drug abuse, two to three times higher in men than in women. Uh, here's a really sad one. 97% of the perpetrators of domestic violence is the man in the relationship. 97%. So that's how men are dealing with this bottled up anxiety. And guys, that is not working out well for us at all. Um, the most disturbing statistic that I came up with has to do with the various mass shootings that we see taking place around this country and, and around the world. And by far, the overwhelming uh, majority of perpetrators in mass shootings are men, of course. Uh, in one study of 292 mass public shootings that took place from 1966 to, 200, to 2012, 292 public mass shootings, exactly one of the perpetrators was a female. So guys, we got a problem on our hands because the anxiety is there. Whether you want to admit it or not, the anxiety, the worry, the self-doubt, it is inside us. And it is, unfortunately, uh, not encouraged in us to let it out and to deal with it. And so what we need to do is learn to find other ways of coping with that anxiety, other ways of letting it go. Because the truth is, and we're going to get to this later in our program, but the truth is, that anxiety is not something that you are forced to deal with. It is not something that you are, um, that you're condemned to. Sure, stuff happens in life. It happens to everybody. But it's the way we respond to it that makes all the difference. And when we will learn to respond to outside pressures that might typically result in anxiety, we can learn to respond in different ways. Now, when we think about anxiety in men, um, one of the things that we have to recognize is a symptom called high functioning anxiety. And for those of you who are uh, watching tonight uh, and who are not necessarily men but might be, uh, have a man as a partner or a friend or a, a colleague and you're concerned, uh, one of the things that's very common is this high functioning anxiety. And what that refers to is a person who on the outside looks just fine. They're cool as a cucumber, they're happy-go-lucky, they appear to be fine, they appear to be well-adjusted, they get all their work done, etc. But inside, they're just breaking up. They're terrified. Uh, they're paranoid, they're terrified, they can't sleep, and yet they put on this great front. And that's what we call high-functioning anxiety. We, have, we, we find high-functioning in a number of different things. We, we have high-functioning alcoholics as well, who, again, nobody close to them would know. They're the only ones who know. And so if you are um, 
in partnership or in, uh, in a marriage with a man or in some kind of relationship, uh, you want to make sure that you be on the lookout because the, the physical signs of anxiety in a man, I'm just going to check this list, make sure I get it covered, um, heart, pounding heart or racing heartbeat all the time, excessive sweating, um, muscle tension, restlessness or agitation, dizziness and vertigo. These are signs of anxiety that are inside us and this is how they show up physically. Shortness of breath or, or some kind of a choking sensation. Uh, insomnia, you can't sleep, uh, sleep at night and in, as it gets more severe, panic attacks. These are the physical symptoms of, anxi of an anxiety problem. Um, on the emotional side, so things that we feel of ourselves on the inside, the emotional uh, signs that you're feeling, that you were experiencing anxiety, constant worrying about what might go wrong. You know, I'm, it's always on my mind. I'm always thinking about things that might go wrong. Feelings of dread, uh, difficulty concentrating if you're trying to get your work done and you can't concentrate it and your mind keeps going to what you think might be wrong. Avoidance uh, strategies where you've got a problem or you've got a task to face, but somehow you keep avoiding it. That's a sign of anxiety. And then the, there's the, our favorite, the catastrophizing, where you know there's there's a threat or there's a there's a problem that shows up, and we immediately go to that worst possible outcome. Uh, you know, the phone rings, and immediately we're thinking, uh oh, what's wrong? It's it's the police calling, and someone's been hurt in a car accident, uh, or there's a knock on the door, and you just you, all the terrible things rush through your mind that it might be. That's the catastrophic thinking that we often occur. Irritability or edginess, you know, if you find the person or if you find yourself or the person you're with to be uh, unusually irritable um, or edgy or something, that might be a sign of anxiety as well. Um, being overly vigilant about dangerous situations, uh, you know, if you're constantly, you know, you pull up to a, uh, a stop sign and you're just terrified that, oh, you know, I might, I might miss the traffic that's coming. I might not see it. A car might come out of the corner and, and hit us, those kinds of things. Absent-mindedness is also a, uh, a symptom of anxiety that you might discover if you find yourself losing your, your uh, ability to concentrate. And then finally, the fear of losing control. You know, you're, we're working so hard to stay in control and we're terrified that we might somehow lose that control and uh, that's uh, that's another sign of the of anxiety that uh, that we want to pay attention to both in ourselves and to the people who are close to us so if you're seeing any of these kinds of signs then you want to check and, and maybe have a conversation with the person and if you're the person that's feeling this then you might want to have a conversation with a close one and say, you know, maybe I'm feeling some anxiety because unfortunately we, many of us get so out of touch with our own internal emotional um, activity that all we're feeling is, I don't know, something's bothering me and we're never quiet enough to really figure out what it is and discovering that, yeah, I'm feeling really worried about something, I'm feeling really anxious, I'm having all kinds of self-doubts going on and I, I've got to deal with them. And we're going to be talking in just a little while about how we can start to open up, how we can give ourselves permission to begin that conversation, to begin the conversation about the anxiety that you're feeling. Now, why might we as men want to go through the effort uh, and it's really sort of an antisocial effort too, uh, because there's so much social conditioning goes on to, to tell us to just rub some dirt, it, rub, excuse me, rub some dirt in it, or um, you know, just sort of buck up, man up. They tell us, don't be a sissy, don't be a baby. But we see the, the results of doing that. It is none of the results of bottling it up and manning up are good. Uh, we just bottle up inside and sooner or later it explodes. And 
You know, I, I talk to a lot of people, uh, and I deal with a lot of people, because here at I Fearless, uh, we're all about ridding the world of anxiety and worry and self-doubt. That's our mission. That's why we're here, to try and help people through this and, and to get out of this agonizing condition that we find ourselves in. Uh, but you know what's interesting is as I talk to people, I hear a lot of people who aren't necessarily conscious of it, but what they're doing is defending why it's okay for me to be anxious. Uh, they, you know, they sort of identify that uh, in themselves. They say, no, I am an anxious person. Uh, I had a workshop not long ago and there was a woman there. She said, well, my mother, was, my mother has anxiety, my sisters have anxiety, every, my grandmother has anxiety, everybody has anxiety. So it's perfectly normal for me. I guess I inherited it somehow. Um, no, there is no anxiety gene that's in your body like you know there is for blue eyes or, or brown hair. Uh, there's no gene like that. You don't inherit anxiety. You get taught it and you get trained that this is a, a normal response, but it's not something that's in your genetic makeup by any stretch. So, but I do hear people trying to defend why it is that it's okay. And some of them really like to hang on to it, and it becomes a, a conversation. And, uh, you know, here's what I'm anxious about today, and you don't know how bad it feels for me to be anxious. Yeah, actually, I do, and that's why we're trying so hard here at I Fearless to get it rid of, help you get rid of it, because it feels awful. You know, there, are, there might be, arguably, although I've never heard an argument that convinced me yet, but there might arguably some be some reasons why you'd say, here's why I, I'm, you know, my anxiety is going to stick around. But I prefer to look at the good reasons to get rid of it. And there are four major drawbacks, if you want, to uh, worry and anxiety. Four really, really great reasons to want to get rid of it. And the first reason is that it just feels awful. Worry and anxiety can be some of the most horrible emotions that we feel as humans. You know, we have such a huge range of emotions. And at the very bottom, though some of the worst ones are the fear-related emotions. And anxiety and, and worry, they are just subsets of fear, aren't they? Uh, we're afraid that something's going to happen to us. And we'll talk a little bit about the subtle differences between worry and anxiety and fear itself, because fear can be a useful thing. But nonetheless, it doesn't feel good. I, you know, if I can avoid have, experiencing that emotion, I'm going to do everything I can to avoid it and not stuffing it down because I'm still feeling it. It still feels awful, but uh, I've stuffed it down. I want to get rid of it completely altogether and be done with it. So that's the first reason, good reason to get rid of anxiety. It just feels horrible. The second reason to get rid of it is that it accomplishes absolutely nothing. There has never been a case where worrying helps solve a problem. Now, I have heard people say that, well, my worry, my anxiety helps me solve problems. And I beg to differ with that. All right? now, you know, what, what they're doing is confusing worry with problem solving. Problem solving is a wonderful thing because we all get problems. We're all faced with challenges in our life, some big, some little. Um, but uh, problem solving is when you take that, that challenge that you're facing and you look at it analytically and you look at the, you know, my resources that I have to deal with this and what I can do and the you know, advantages and disadvantages of different courses of action. And then I choose a course of action and I act on it. And if it works, the problem's gone. If it doesn't work, I'll try something else. That's problem solving. Worry and anxiety, though, those are totally different. What worry and anxiety do is just keep going over and over the problem again and again and again. Right? So tomorrow you're thinking the same thoughts as you were yesterday and next week and next month. We don't go anywhere. We just go around and around in circles with this same problem. We, we like to call that mentating. Mentating is where, you know, that when your brain is just going and you're 
all you're thinking of is that one topic, and you don't make any forward progress with it, you're just going over the same thing again and again and again. That's worry and anxiety, and it doesn't help at all. No problem has ever been solved and gone away because of anxiety. Now, if anxiety turns into problem solving, great. But when that happens, you don't have the anxiety anymore. And that awful feeling goes away. When you're problem solving and taking action, it feels good. Because now I'm feeling in control. I'm feeling that I've regained the power over my life. Anxiety feels like I've lost all the power in my life, doesn't it? So that's the, uh, that's the second good reason to get rid of uh, anxiety. It, it accomplishes nothing. The third good reason to get rid of it, it makes you sick. Literally, anxiety, chronic anxiety will make you sick. Now, it's really um, you know, disturbing to the point of funny to read. Uh, you know, I went to the Mayo Clinic website and, and talk, you know, looking at anxiety and the side effects of chronic anxiety. Here's their list, all right? Restlessness, panic attacks, increased heart rate, hyperventilation, sweating, trembling, feeling weak or tired, trouble concentrating, gastrointestinal problems, depression, headaches, irritability, heart palpitations, muscle aches, and loss of libido. There you go. Yeah. You know, what's all that compared to just a little anxiety? I'll, I'll hang on to my anxiety, thanks very much, rather than get rid of all these horrible things. And literally, you leave it go long enough, it can kill you. Because one of the effects of anxiety, see, because your body, when you're feeling anxious, what's happening is that you've perceived a threat somewhere. There's something going on out in the world that you perceive is a threat to you in some way, uh, whatever it is. And when you feel threatened, your body is designed to kick into action mode. It kicks into, you know, the, in response to fear, there's the fight or flight. Now, both of those require energy and strength. And so what happens is that your body, the, the, your adrenal glands start pumping what's called cortisol. Cortisol gets pumped into your bloodstream. And that is your body's built-in alarm system. It sets your body up for that fight or flight response. And it, uh, it's, it readies you to deal with the crisis. Your body goes on high alert. Your muscles tighten. Your breathing increases. Your heart rate goes up. All these things happen to get you ready, and, the way, and of course the source of it, to get you ready to fight off that saber-toothed tiger that was about to jump on you and eat you for dinner. And so millions of years ago, this response was a really useful one. The problem, though, is that if this code red that your body goes into lasts for too long, you know, it's designed for a short, uh, short bursts of energy to either get out of the room or, you know, off up into a tree to avoid the tiger, or to prevail in a, in a conflict, in a fight. But all, those things last a short period of time, and then the crisis is over. Anxiety, though, lasts long periods of time. I mean, we can go on and on and on, sometimes you know, weeks, months, even years at a time. People have this chronic anxiety. And when your body is in that heightened code red status, and it's constantly pumping this cortisol into your bloodstream, it compromises your immune system. And, you know, right now in the midst of uh, COVID-19, boy, do we ever need our immune systems. So this is a lousy time to have chronic anxiety because it's weakening you. And there have been uh, relationships found between cortisol and diabetes, osteoporosis, and heart disease. So chronic anxiety literally can kill you and does regularly, you know, whether it's through suicide or whether it's through heart attack or whether it's through diabetes, all these things that it can bring on. So there's the third reason to get rid of it. The fourth reason, it, and, and to me this is the most significant reason of all, to want to rid yourself of anxiety, and that is that it blocks your innate human potential. Now, how does it do that? Well, when we're anxious, 
when we are in a self-doubt mode, when we are um, questioning our ability and worrying about uh, something that's going to threaten us, we are not in a highly self-confident mode. We're not in a high self-esteem mode where we have the, the courage and the, um, uh, and the energy to try things that we might not otherwise try. And so what happens is we block our own potential before we even try. We set up the roadblocks, we set up the barriers to our own progress. So something that you might try, something simple, you know, um, I want to ask her out on a date. Oh, but, you know, I, what if she doesn't, what if she thinks I'm too short? What if she thinks my, you know, I, I'm not built like uh, Dwayne Johnson? What if she thinks uh, I don't make enough money? Well, so, so the best way out of that, don't ever ask her, right? That's the, that's the perfect way to avoid that situation. And so this anxiety blocks our potential. What about at, you're at work and you're thinking about asking the boss for a raise or a promotion, but that anxiety, that little voice in your head says, oh, you're not up to that. Oh no, he's probably going to turn you down. And so you never even try. Or maybe you're, you've got at a job, but you've always dreamed about go, you know, starting your own little side gig, you know, side hustle, they call it these days, and getting, starting your own business. Well, the anxiety, the self-doubt that's built in, will, that is your biggest, the barrier is not the lack of capital. The barrier is not, oh, there's too many of these kinds of businesses in the place already. No, those aren't the barriers. The barrier is right inside here when that voice in your own head says, no, you can't do that. You'll never succeed at that, so don't even try. And to me, that is the tragic loss that anxiety and worry and self-doubt create. And for men who pride ourselves on this, who pride ourselves on being the brave ones, being the uh, ones who can go out, you know, kill the buffalo and bring it back for dinner, we're those ones. And if that anxiety is in there, and yet we still have to do that because society is demanding of it, what kind of internal turmoil is that causing in us, is it? So there's four really great reasons to get rid of your anxiety completely. No need for it whatsoever. Let's just let it go. And we're going to be talking about how to let that go in just a few minutes. But first, I want to talk for a few minutes about what it is that men are actually anxious about. Because, um, you know, it, it's good to recognize in ourselves what are these things that, we're, that we tend to be so worried about. Well, they're surprisingly universal whether it's, you know, and we go through and, and, uh, and all kinds of studies made and, and surveys taken, what is it that men are worried about? And uh, the first one we share with all our female counterparts, and that is body image. All right, men are just as worried about their body image as women are. We're worried, are we tall enough? You know, I can't go out with her, she's taller than me. Well, maybe she's the love of your life. And so what if she's got an inch on you? Yeah, but society says that the man's supposed to be taller, and I'm worried about that. And of course, hair. Oh, yeah, we're going to lose the hair, aren't we? Well, you know, I'm spe you're talking to somebody who's already in the well-advanced stages of losing it. And I'll tell you, yeah, you know, it's, it's the sort of thing you think, I kind of wish I had the hair. And, and, and how about hair color, too? Um, you know, I was looking the other day, I was on TV, and there, Paul McCartney was on there. And I can't figure out. He's, uh, he's a good 50, 10 or 15 years older than I am, but he's still got all his dark hair. What happened to me? <laughs> and so we've, you know, we've got these body image things, don't we? We worry about aging. And then the big body image one for men, penis size, right? Or performance, or, uh, you know, or the appearance of it. We, we spend so much time thinking about that and worrying about that. Now we can't talk about it. Nobody's allowed to say anything, but it's there, aren't we? Okay, so that body image. Another thing men worry about is money. 
constantly worrying about money. We worry about our earning power because we're supposed to be the breadwinner, aren't we? Right? That term is applied to men. We're, you're the breadwinner, son. Now you go out and look after your family, care for the women and children. And these pressures are put on. But what if I can't earn enough money? What if suddenly, what if I can't get a job that makes me earn enough money? How does that reflect on me? And I worry about that because I'm supposed to be the provider. And suddenly I can't. And so I carry all this anxiety around with me, don't we? Another thing men tend to worry about is what we'll call relevance. Am I relevant? Men like to be important or like to feel important. Where are they in their career based on their age? Here I am, I'm 38 years old, I, I haven't moved as far in my career as I should have by this time. Maybe I'm not relevant. Am I being a good husband, a good father? Or will I discover that they can get along just fine without me? That's the relevance concern that men have. And, and then men tend to worry about their self-identity. Who am I? Who am I really? And, and men, because of the social role that we've been given, we resist taking time for self-reflection, for self-examination, for emotional growth. And then suddenly what happens, if you're 40 or 50 years old, suddenly this all erupts in you in what the brunt of a million jokes, the midlife crisis. Get yourself a red sports car, you'll be fine. No. Because what's happening here is suddenly, it, it's not a midlife crisis that a red sports car will fix. It's a mid-course correction because suddenly you've discovered, I, I'm way off. Who I really am and who I want to be isn't who I am at all. I wake up every morning, I look in the mirror and I see somebody and it's a complete stranger. And I think, how did I get here? This is a huge source of anxiety for men. And yet, we have to push it down because it's become the brunt of jokes, hasn't it? Oh, you're just having a midlife crisis, aren't you? So that's a source of anxiety for men. We're afraid of relationships, aren't we? Again, you know, we worry about the relationships. We fear, you know, for the women and the partners in our life, we fear that we might disappoint them. We don't, we're not living up to their expectations somehow. And yet, we don't feel we can talk about that at all. Other men can also be a threat, especially early on in a relationship, right? If you're, you know, if you're just dating somebody and suddenly you're hearing about ex-boyfriends and oh, all the pictures that are going through your head, aren't they? Okay, about, well, was he better looking than me? Was he bigger and stronger? Did he drive a fancier car than me? And we feel all this threat, but we're not allowed to talk about it. That's the more source of anxiety. Men have anxiety about vulnerability, about feeling vulnerable. We're, we feel anxious about having and showing emotions at all because we're told and taught from the earliest days that we're not supposed to have and show emotions. That's unmanly. And yet here they are. They're showing up. Quick, bottle them down. Why are they showing up? Is there something wrong with me? We worry if we've made the wrong choice. We worry if we made a wrong decision. And yet we're not allowed to ask for help, are we? You know, the sta again, another standing joke about men asking for directions. We're not supposed to. The reason we don't ask for directions is because we're supposed to know all these things. We're terrified that we don't, but you're supposed to know the way. You're supposed to know how to drive a stick shift. You're supposed to know in the middle of the night how to get through this strange city. And so it, when we ask for directions, if we stop and say, I need help, that's a, a showing of vulnerability, showing of weakness. And we are not allowed to show that because it's been conditioned into us that we're not allowed to show that. Um, yeah, so, so those are, uh, you know, th there's lots more. Uh, but these are some of the main things that men worry about. Which brings us, of course, to the question, why? Why do men worry about all these things? And it comes down to one massive uh, reason, and that is social conditioning. Men from birth, and were brought up in traditional households, have been told, have been encouraged to handle the problems on your own, to be a success, to always 
keep your weaknesses to yourself. Never let the other guy, you know, never let him see you cry. Never let him see you blink. This is what we've been taught from the earliest ages. And we've even been given uh, and taught strategies to suppress those emotions, haven't we? We've been taught how to. And we've been taught that um, it's much more socially acceptable for a man to act out his aggression, act out in aggressive ways, or to abuse substances, over, over drink. You know, they, oh, it's, just, it's just boys being boys, these guys that are so, uh, you know, so smashed, and then they try and get in their car because I'm all right, I can drive. It's ridiculous. And it's all this social conditioning, isn't it? So we bottle it up, which eventually explodes on us. Or we withdraw and become completely passive. I'm just not seeing anything. And then that passive aggression comes out in different ways as well. And our partners can't figure out what's going on. So none of it is helping to us. The majority of men um, find it uh, acceptable to use unhealthy coping strategies. And that makes the traditional um, image of masculinity completely toxic. You know, I, I find that the, the, the traditional view of the masculine man, I, yes, I find it, uh, there are al elements of it that I find appealing and that I like to emulate, but there are huge swaths of it that are just plain poisonous because men cope with their emotions and their, um, and their anxieties with alcohol, with drugs, with uh, sex, with overeating, with anger, with violence, with aggression. And we see it, I shared some of those statistics with you earlier, and they're right there. And this is all in order to try and cope with the anxieties that are bottled up in, inside us. Now, the social conditioning goes on because w when men don't conform or don't adhere to traditional masculine gender stereotypes, they experience backlash. Because if you show your vulnerability, or if you act nicer, or if you display empathy, or if you express sadness or an emotion or weakness, or if you exhibit modesty in any kind of a way, or if you proclaim to support feminism, that's going to get you in trouble with the brotherhood. And, and unfortunately, it's very, very true. Now, it may not be overt, but it's there. Guys, you've experienced it all. Um, and this discourages men from behaving in ways that have been proven time and time again to be beneficial to themselves, to their teams, to their careers, to their families. These are the things that happen to us. All right. And so, you know, for example, uh, showing vulnerability. And I just want to read you this. There, there's a study. Men are socialized not to show vulnerability. And there was a study, uh, and, and it can be penalized. There was a study in 2015 when male, but not female, leaders, so executives, when male leaders, male executives, ask for help, they are viewed by their uh, peers and their reports, their direct reports, as less competent, less capable, and less confident. So when you ask for help, the people around you, guys, think, oh, you must not be as good as we thought you were. And so what do we do? We never ask for help, do we? When men make themselves vulnerable by disclosing a weakness at work, so if you say, well, I'm not very good at that, the perception in these studies that showed the surveys are this, that they're perceived to have a lower status. Isn't that interesting, the way this social conditioning works on us? Isn't that a shame? And so we're left to deal with this anxiety. So what do you say we deal with it, shall we? Let's dive into this part of my program where we're going to talk about what we can do about it. And I want to give you two steps. And the first step is to embrace what I like to call an enlightened view 
of masculinity. Let's call it a healthy man masculinity. Let's go, let's dub it manhood 2.0. All right, let's let's uh, let's patent that catchphrase or, or trademark or something. And the way I want you to th approach this is, first of all, guys, we uh, you know we pride ourselves on being clever and being intelligent. And I know everybody that's here in this program tonight is intelligent and clever. I mean, you know, maybe you're not in Mensa, uh, but you're smart enough to say, hey, you know, this might be an important thing for me to pay attention to. And so here we are. So you're smart. And that smartness, that cleverness is going to allow you to recognize the fact that there's a fundamental flaw in the traditional view of masculinity, isn't there? There is a problem there that just doesn't compute. And so I want the first step for you to recognize and say, okay, there's, there's something wrong here. And I'm not a guy who goes along with stuff that's wrong or broken or incorrect in some way. You know, it's, it's like, um, you remember that children's fairy tale, The Emperor's New Clothes? Remember that one? When, you know, these two shysters come to town and they got nothing, they got no money, and they're trying to work some kind of a scam, and they convince everybody that they're tailors and that they work uh, with only with this magical thread and cloth. And it's so magical, it's so special, that the only people that can see this cloth and this thread are the really smart people, the really competent ones. And so nobody's going to admit that I'm not smart and I'm not competent, so they'll all say, oh, yeah, I can see it. And then it gets to the emperor, the king, and he hears about these guys and he says, wow, if it's that special, I'm going to want a suit made of these clothes. And he goes to see them and he can't see anything either, but the king can't admit that he can't see them because that would be admitting that he's not smart, that he's not uh, fit to be king. And so he goes right along with the scam and says, yeah, they're gorgeous. And these two guys sit there and they're raking in the gold and they're pretending to sew all day long when they're producing nothing and they're trying to suppress their laughter. And finally the day comes for the king to try on his new clothes and he's butt naked strolling down the street and everybody's saying, oh, wow, that's so beautiful. And finally it takes some little kid who hasn't been conditioned socially enough yet to say, just excuse me, but he kind of looks naked to me. they got to call them on it. And that's what we have to do with this masculinity thing. We got to call ourselves on it because it is toxic, poisonous. So what I want you to do is I want you to use traditional masculinity to debunk traditional masculine stereotypes. All right. You're smart. You're in charge of things. You're the powerful one. Why not call, you know, call BS on this traditional masculinity thing, say that's not serving anybody. It's hurting us. So I'm not going to participate anymore. Because if you buy into it, you've been duped. It's a scam. Traditional masculinity is a scam. And if you buy into it, you've been completely duped. So that's step one. Let's use traditional masculinity to debunk traditional masculine stereotypes. And just say, no, sorry, I'm smarter than that. Step two. Step two is where we choose to let this anxiety go. We're going to choose to simply let it go. And how do we do that? Well, um, some of you may have seen, some of you have uh, copies of my new book. Uh, came out last fall. And it's called Unsubscribe from anxiety. And as the title implies, uh, anxiety is a choice that we get to make. And just like unwanted emails that you might get, you can click unsubscribe and then they won't show up anymore. Anxiety is the same thing. And for us to recognize that, uh, for us to recognize that anxiety is a choice, we want to back up a little bit. And I want to walk you through this. First of all, uh, I want you to become an expert in anxiety. And I know you're saying, oh, I'm already an expert in anxiety. I carry too much of around with it with me all the time, and I'm trying to get rid of it. I don't want more of it. You're right. 
You don't want more of it. So here's how we get rid of it. And here's how we start to overcome it. I want you, and, and I do in my workshops and in, in the book, I ask people to, uh, to imagine that they're scientists in a laboratory and that we're going to study this anxiety. And here we are, we've got our white lab coats on and there's a blob of anxiety sitting on our laboratory bench in front of us. And we're going to examine it and test it and poke and prod it and, poke and probe it and we're going to dissect it and find out what it's made of so that we can know everything there is to know about it. And having knowing everything there is to know about it, we can then decide what we want to do with it. And the other thing that this exercise does is it allows us to detach ourselves from anxiety. One of the problems with anxiety is that it, it almost becomes who we are. And I want, for example, let's say you get a cut on your finger, right? Uh, you know, you're chopping onions in the kitchen and the knife slips and now you've got a little cut on your finger. Well, it hurts and it's bleeding and you go and you put a band-aid on it and it's fine. But you can feel that pain, can't you? You feel the pain right there in the tip of your finger. It's highly localized. Your finger hurts like heck, but your left foot is just fine. All right? You're not thinking, oh, my whole self hurts because I cut my finger. Anxiety, on the other hand, is a different kind of pain. Anxiety occupies your entire self. And so the pain of anxiety isn't localized. It's your entire self. And even the words that we use reflect this. So we say, I have a cut on my finger. But then we say, I am worried. So worry is who I am. That's part of my identity. The cut is not part of your identity. It's just a temporary situation that'll go away soon. It'll heal up. But anxiety? No, that's who I am. And by studying it, we can start to become a little more detached from it instead of uh, embracing this as a personal uh, identity we can start detaching and saying, no, I have some anxiety right now that I would like to get rid of. I would like to heal it. But I am not anxiety. That's not who I am. So let's go back up. I, I said earlier that anxiety is a subset of fear. Let's talk about fear and anxiety. Fear is, um, fear is a response to a real and present danger. And you're, as I said earlier, your body is designed to respond to danger, to the perception of danger. So you're walking along, you step out into the street to cross the street, and you look to your left, and there's a bus coming at you, right? It's coming right at you, and it's about to knock you down. Fear kicks in. The adrenaline starts pumping into your blood. The cortisol pumps in. Your body sets up to fight or flight. The bus, I'm not going to fight it, so I'm getting the heck out of here and I run back to the curb, and I'm safe. And at that point, the fear goes away, doesn't it? Now, your heart might pump for a little while, but you're not feeling anxious because the threat is gone. Anxiety, however, is a response to a different kind of perceived threat. It's a response to a much more vague threat, a threat that's more off in the distance, and we're really not sure what it actually is. So you might be feeling anxious about um, an upcoming exam. So if you're a student in school, or you're, you've got an interview with the boss, you know, your performance review, or you've got, um, uh, you've got a mole on your arm that wasn't there before, and now you're thinking about that. So these are threats that are somewhat vague. We're not exactly sure what the threat is. We're not exactly sure what to do about it. And they're not right here, right now. They're somewhere off in the distance, aren't they? And that's what anxiety is. So we're imagining the threat. We're imagining that something is going to hurt us, but we're not quite sure what to do about it. And, but the body can't tell the difference. It says, uh oh, you know, we're being attacked somehow. So it kicks in. And that's where the chronic anxiety comes in because we're on this red alert situation. Um, the structure of anxiety, is, you know, the things that we're afraid of. We went through a list of things that we're afraid of. But, uh, you know, if you recall, you probably heard of Abram Maslow. 
uh, psychologist, American psychologist back in the early part of the mid part of the 20th century. Uh, and he developed this uh, theory of man's hierarchy of needs. And he says that there are five levels of needs and the most basic ones, you know, the fact that you need food and you need shelter. Uh, those needs need to be taken care of before you can look after any other needs. And the next up needs, you know, then it moves up to, um, to relev social relevance and meaning something. And at the highest levels, uh, there are about self-actualization. Who am I? And I become, well, I'm not going to worry about who am I and, you know, why was I put here on earth? if I'm starving to death and the bus is coming at me. Trust me, those are not top of mind issues. And so when we look at fear, we start to see when any of those things on Maslow's chart, we perceive that they might be taken, they either are being taken away or we perceive that they might be taken away. That's when anxiety starts to kick in. Now the interesting thing, or one of the many interesting things is that when it comes to anxiety, the vast majority of things that we find ourselves worrying about never actually come true. They exist solely in our minds. And there's a neat uh, acronym for fear, F-E-A-R, fear. It's called the fantasized events appearing real. So this event that we're terrified of doesn't exist out there in the world, and it may or may not ever. If it does, it's certainly way off in the future. And yet it's here in our mind and our body is responding in exactly the same way as if it were there. The body can't tell the difference. Now we talked about, uh, you know, the pros and cons of anxiety. Some people say, well, I like my anxiety. It's part of who I am. It gets me sympathy. It helps me show people that I care, etc." But we went down that list of four reasons why anxiety is not a good thing. So, I think we can conclude that, okay, this anxiety thing, I don't need it in my life. I'd like to get rid of it. So then in our study, in our laboratory here, we are, then says, we, why are we anxious? How and why are we anxious? And one of the things that we discover is that the world, the world around us, is conspiring to make us more and more worried and anxious. Yeah, literally, they are conspiring. I can be a conspiracy theorist if I want, all right? But it's actually true. Because from our earliest days, from, the, from birth, we are being taught to worry about things. And our parents, uh, you know, when they brought us up, don't talk to strangers. Uh-oh, don't, you know, you should, don't go near that house. Uh, there's bad people live there. Uh, and uh, we're taught about stranger danger. And, uh, oh, don't play with that. that. Don't play with the knife. It's sharp. You might cut yourself. You don't play, don't play with those, uh, the things in the medicine cabinet. You'll poison yourself and, and we lock everything up. And when the children are very, very small, that's great. Because when you're six or seven or eight years old walking home from school alone, don't talk to strangers is really, really good advice. But when you're 35 or 38 or 45 years old and you're still afraid to talk to strangers because you've got this... Uh, xenophobia, well, that's not good at all. That's really unhealthy, and we ought to do something about it. But that the world takes over in that training, because what are we exposed to? 24 hours a day, seven days a week, we are exposed to the news, aren't we? I mean, I walk through an airport. I'm looking forward to walking through an airport again at some point in the future, by the way. But, you know, I walk through an airport or you sit in a, 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 you go to a sports bar and all these TVs. And what are they? They're CNN, they're Fox News, they're the Weather Channel. And what are they? They've got to fill 24 hours a day of programming. And they know that people love drama. And so they fill it with the stories that scare us. And they, you know, and they, they start off the news by, here's what's happening right now. You need to know about this. Here's what you need to know right now. Well. I really don't like the news. And I went through a period of, you know, just sort of looking at the news once a day, 10 minutes I'd give myself. But starting about, I don't know, a month, six weeks ago, I said no. Because even after, if I restricted myself to 10 minutes of news I'd re and only read the headlines, for the next hour or so I'd feel awful. 
because I'm worried about this and I'm angry about that. And I'm thinking, I don't need this. So I stopped. And I've never felt better. I'm aware of what's going on in the world. You can't not be aware, but I don't dive into it and, and immerse myself in it. Because the world is teaching me to be worried. It tells me, you should be worried about this. And if you're not, there's something wrong with you. And that's not good. And so what happens is we get into this um, worry mode, and the worrying becomes a mental habit. It's a choice to worry, because I can choose to worry or not worry, depending on the situation. I can choose to worry about global uh, warming. I can choose to worry about um, racial inequality. And then I sit there and worry. Or I can choose to not worry. Or I can choose to take some action about it. Both of which would be a whole lot better than just sitting there worrying. But the worry has been built into us for so long that it has become a mental habit that we don't question. And because everybody else around us is also worrying, is also anxious, we think it's normal. Because anxiety is, in fact, normal. Normal meaning that the vast majority of people do it. It does not mean that it's either natural or required or useful. Remember what we said about it? It never accomplishes anything. But nobody seems to ever question that. Nobody says, well, what good would it do me to worry about this? Will that help? And the answer is no, it won't help at all. But go ahead and worry anyway, because all the rest of us are. <laughs> no, I, I'd rather not, thank you very much, because I value my health, I value my mental health, and I value my peace of mind. So I will choose a different mental response, a different emotional response than worry, thanks very much. Because the worry, the anxiety, doesn't help at all. So we were trained to worry. We were trained and we are encouraged and reinforced and constantly reminded that we're supposed to be worrying. Have you ever met those people? You run into, you, we all know them, right? You walk up and say, oh, what a beautiful day. Look at that blue sky. Yeah, but it's, uh, they're calling for rain this afternoon. <laughs> I call it the complaining club. Right? And I've, I've uh, handed in my membership to it. If I find myself with somebody that is one of these chronic complainers, I'll leave because I don't need it there because it's con that kind of emotion is contagious. And I'd rather not catch that anxiety germ. Thanks very much. You know, we've all got challenges in our life. I don't need to have everybody else and CNN and Fox News and the Weather Channel piling it on top of me. I just don't need it. So I'll tune it out. Thanks very much. So how do we unsubscribe from anxiety? Well, the first step, as we've taken now, is to get to know it and get to realize that anxiety is a, ch first of all, it's a choice. And it's a choice that has become a mental habit. And it's a mental habit that gets reinforced over and over and over again by the world around you, by the media, by social media, by your friends, by your family, constantly reinforcing in us that we should be worried about things because it's normal. They all do it, so you should as well. So that's the first step. And so as scientists, we've now distanced ourselves from this blob of anxiety and said, hmm, okay, this thing isn't quite so scary as I thought. It's, you know, it's only scary if I choose for it to be scary. I don't have to be scared of it. Because here's another interesting thing. No matter what situation you're facing, what challenge you're facing, um, you know, it could be an illness. It could be financial, it could be relationship, it could be any number of things that you're, uh, or it could be work-related. And we're finding ourselves anxious about it. Uh, and we decide that, oh, this is too much, this is, you know, I, I, I don't know how to do, deal with this, and, and so I pull in and I don't try. But for every one of those problems that we have, there have been millions and millions of people before you who have faced the same problem. And some of them succumbed to it and others said, no, I'm not going to let this 
get me down. I'm not going to let this take me down. I'm not going to let this affect my happiness and my joy. And they found a way around it. And that in itself is proof that you can do. You can as well. And so anxiety comes with an off switch. I like that image, right? You know, right there on the side of your brain. No thanks, I'm going to turn it off. We can do that. Now, habits are habits, aren't they? And, you know, any habit, if you decide it's no longer serving you, you can decide that I'm going to let it go. Even guys. You know, when guys, and, and we all pride ourselves on being so smart, if somebody pointed out to you that you were being duped, that you were being tricked into this anxiety, wouldn't you say, hey, I'm not, not me. I'm out of here. Well, that's exactly what we can do. We can flip that off switch for ourselves. Because anxiety is not something we come born with. You know, interesting, um, there's a generally supported theory that infants are born with two and only two fears. What are they? The fear of loud noises and the fear of falling. There's somehow that, that seems to be genetic that we're built in with this. Everything else, fear of losing your hair, fear of um, people that look different than us or think differently than us, fear of losing your job, all these things are learned along the way. And so let's unlearn them. Let's decide that anxiety, like any other bad habit that, does no, that doesn't serve you any longer, is something I'd like to get rid of. How do we do this? Well, the, let's start. Well, we've, we've already started. I keep saying let's start. The next step, you've decided you want to get rid of anxiety. One of the feelings of anxiety is a feeling of powerlessness, a feeling that, um, that I don't have the strength, I don't have the power to do what needs to be done. And so one of the ways that we can accomplish, that we can get past that barrier, is by reminding ourselves of all the amazing uh, accomplishments that we've had in our past. So there's a great little exercise that I like to do, and that is to go back in your mind to the period when you were young, before you were 18, before you turned 18 years old. And I want you to think of five accomplishments, five successes that you had before you turned 18 years old. Now, what might they be? Well, maybe you, um, uh, maybe you hit a home run on the baseball team. Maybe you got selected for the baseball team. Maybe you wrote a poem and got up in front of the class and read it. Maybe you got picked for a school play. Maybe you gave a speech. Maybe you uh, won a merit badge in Boy Scouts or Girl Guides. Whatever it is, um, I want you to remember that. And I want you to go back to that place, that feeling place, the emotions that you experienced in that moment when you had this success, you had this accomplishment. And remember how good that felt. And prior to the accomplishment, you felt a little nervous about it. And yet somehow you reached deep into yourself and you you pulled it off and it felt fantastic and that happened regularly but we forget about those things and we focus on what's not working so remind yourself five things before you turned 18 and when you're done that I want you to move on and find five things that from when you were in college or when you had your first job in that early those early adult years what did you when you got your first job when you got accepted into the college, when you got a good mark, when you graduated from college. All right, these are all things that you worried about and yet you overcame them, didn't you? You had the strength in you. You had the smarts, the abilities to overcome these challenges. Good for you. Guess what? It's the same you sitting there today working on overcoming some different challenges. But that same you still has those resources, still has that ingenuity, still has that desire to overcome those problems. Well, then move on to, you know, to into when you were in your 30s or wherever you are now. And then move right up to last week. Five things that you accomplished last week that you were really proud of. 
Maybe it was you cooked a great dinner. Maybe it was uh, you spent some time talking to your son or your daughter and they felt good about it and you felt good about it because you learned how you listened properly. All right, be proud of yourself for that. These are successes that you're having constantly. When we focus only on the things that we're, uh, that we're anxious and worried about, then our self-esteem just dries right up. And when we lose that self-esteem, we lose self-confidence and we can't do anything. We block ourselves, like we said before. We become our own big barrier to it. But when we remember all these accomplishments we've had, suddenly that self-esteem starts coming back up. It bubbles back. Hey, and you find yourself sitting up straight and you say, yeah, I can do this. I'm not quite sure how just yet, but I'm going to figure out a way, just like I have in the past. That's a wonderful exercise, and I encourage you to do that regularly. Get a journal and write down these successes and bask in those feelings of how it felt when you accomplished it. The next step in our road to fearlessness here, and not the kind of fearlessness that is that toxic stereotype masculinity, but the fearlessness that comes from genuine self-esteem and genuine self-confidence, not the bottled up explosive kind. But the next step is to decide that you're going to take 100% responsibility for everything that happens in your life and around you. Now, this is a tough one, but boy, oh boy, is it uh, empowering. Because you can say, well, right now we're in the midst of this uh, coronavirus epidemic. I'm not responsible for that. And yet here I am stuck at home. Maybe I lost my job. Maybe, uh, you know, I'm tearing my hair out, whatever it is. It's somebody else's problem. But here's the situation. And here's the thing. As long as you decide that whatever problem you're facing is the responsibility of somebody else, or something else, you are completely powerless to do anything about it. You can't do anything about it if, as long as you point the finger and say, well, it's his fault. Because until he decides to change, you're stuck. But when you say, no, no, I'm taking responsibility for this. I can't make the pandemic go away, but I can change my response to it. I can decide that I'm going to take a much more empowered response to this current situation. And if you find yourself, you know, your job's gone away. Okay, what am I going to do about this? I can sit here all day and whine and complain and drink, kick the dog, but that doesn't help anybody, does it? Most especially, it doesn't help you. So you decide, no, I'm going to take responsibility for this. I'm going to be the one who's in charge. And now you've regained the power to control your life. And any time you catch yourself blaming or complaining about a situation, I mean, I was on the phone with somebody the other day, and uh, they were just, oh, well, my husband did this, and my friend did that, and the worker did this, and they're such jerks. And I'm thinking, okay, so everybody else in your life is responsible for the problems that you're now experiencing or you're feeling so you're powerless. Why are you talking to me? <laughs> Go away. But as soon as you decide, okay, you know, maybe these other people did things that I didn't like, but until I take responsibility and say, what am I going to do now? You're stuck. But by saying, here's what I'm going to do now, suddenly you're free to, to, to take control of the situation. That's how you start taking control. Catch yourself blaming and complaining and saying, uh-oh, here I go again. And that adds to my anxiety. I don't want to be anxious. So I'm going to stop complaining. I'm going to stop pointing the finger. And whether that finger is at your spouse, your kids, your dog, your boss, your government, your whoever, the climate, big, big corporate whatevers, doesn't matter. As long as you decide, no, I'm going to take responsibility here. The game changes completely when you do that. I want you to also raise your awareness. I want you to catch yourself when you're worrying. Catch yourself. Say, oh, there I go again. Don't judge it and say, oh, I shouldn't be worrying. I've got to stop worrying. No, no. 
just be observant. Say, okay, anytime you have a habit, first of all, you've got to be aware that when the habit kicks in before you can get rid of it. And you can say, mm, no, no, oh, there I go worrying it. Don't judge yourself, just observe that, you know, there I am worrying again. I'd, I'd like to stop, but I'm just making a note, and I'm making a list of the things that I'm worrying about. Oh, there I'm worrying about my job again. Oh, there I'm worrying about my, my hair loss again. Okay, just observe. And then, and of course, we've decided that that's simply a mental habit, and I can get rid of that. But now we're working up to, to getting rid of it. Um, so we've identified the worries, and now we want to take control of them. I want you to do this thing for me, do this little exercise for, with, together with me, all right? I want you to think about the thing, your, your biggest worry. Take a minute and, and just ponder for yourself and find out, all right, what is my biggest worry? What do I find myself anxious about most often? Is it my job? Is it my health? Is it my relationships? Is it my, um, my uh, financial situation? Whatever it is, think about it for a second. And I want you to really feel it, internalize it for a minute so that you're, I want you to get anxious right now with that, with that worry that you've got. And now I want you to just, just close your eyes for a second. I'll just keep talking here, but close your eyes for a second. And I want you to imagine that worry, that anxiety, as being inside your body. I want you to imagine it inside your body because it always shows up. Sometimes it shows up in your jaw and your tension in your jaw. Sometimes it's in your head. Sometimes it's off. A lot of people get it in their shoulders or, or in their stomach. You know, it shows up as tension there. But I want you, with your eyes closed, identify where in your body this tension this physical tension, this is anxiety showing up as a physical manifestation. Where in your body is it? And I want you to feel it there. I want you to feel it right there um, as it's in your body. So let's say it's in your shoulders. For me often, and when I used to have anxiety, I've given up the habit now. But for me it used to show up as a tension in my shoulders. And it would feel like an iron rod, and my shoulders would be so stiff. And, uh, and then it's, you know, sort of, I can feel that there. Visualize this as an object inside you. So if, it, if it's in your, in your shoulders, visualize this steel rod that goes from one shoulder across to the other. And it's absolutely rigid. If your anxiety shows up in your stomach, or, Picture it, this iron ball, this really rigid thing that's there in your stomach, wherever it is. Now imagine it there. Now, what I want you to do, using your imagination, keep your eyes closed, but using your imagination, I want you to take this anxiety object that's inside you, and I want you to shrink it. So if it's that steel bar in your shoulders, I want you to, instead of going from shoulder to shoulder, I want you to make it shorter. Make it shorter, make it shorter, and now it's shrinking, and now it's only sort of in the middle of your chest. And now make it bigger again, right out to your shoulder tips. And now I want you to take it and stretch it right out, like outside your shoulders. Make it go all the way to touch both walls in the room that you are in right now. Now shrink it back down again, and bring it inside your body. Can you feel this? Can you feel that you're starting to move this thing around? Now I want you to take that anxiety object that's there inside your body, and I want you to start moving it around in your body. Let's start off by taking it down your left leg, all the way down past your thigh and your knee and your calf, out down into your foot. So now that anxiety object that used to be in your jaw or in your shoulders is down in your left foot. You got it there? Yeah, good. Now bring it back up your left leg. Cross it over your hips and bring it down your right leg. Let it go right down to your right foot. Sit there for a second. Now back up your right leg. Cross over to your left shoulder. 
Now let's take it out your left hand, left arm, right down. You can feel it through your bicep and your elbow and your forearm, and now it's out into your fingers. Feel it there? All right. Isn't this fun? Now you can start moving it around. And what's happening here is you're starting to take control of this silly thing that's been occupying you. Now bring it back up. Back up your left arm, across your shoulders and out your right arm. Down your right arm, past your elbow and into your hand. Only this time what I want you to do is make it come out of your hand and just hold it in the palm of your hand. Think of it like it's baseball. You know, it's like about the size of a baseball and it's this anxiety thing. And in your imagination, I want you to look at it. And see what color it is and what shape it is and what texture it is. And is it hard or is it soft? And like a baseball, just sort of toss it a couple of times up and down and up and down and just catch it, feel the weight of it. Now with your imagination, I want you to take it and I want you to set it down on the floor beside your feet. Just set it down there and look at it in your imagination. Just look at this piece of anxiety sitting there on the floor. Looks a lot like that blob we had on the laboratory bench a little while ago. Now reach down, pick it back up. Now I want you to hold it in your right hand, bring it close to you, and watch it for a minute. And watch it, I want you to watch it turn into sort of smoke and fog and kind of dissolve. And now it's all light and airy. I want you to take a deep breath and just, I want you to blow it away. And just watch all that dust just evaporate. And now what I want you to do is go back to the place where that anxiety was in your body before. Remember? Whether it was in your shoulders or your jaw or your stomach. Is it still there? And if it's there, is it a whole lot less than it used to be? <laughs> That's kind of cool. Because what has happened is that you have decided that you're going to be the one that's in charge of this anxiety, not it in charge of you. Remember the difference between I have a cut versus I am worried? You are no longer your anxiety. You simply had it and now you decide to get rid of it. That's how we get rid of anxiety. Now, anxiety is a habit, isn't it? Oh, you bet it's a habit. And what, hab what happens to habits? Habits love to come back. And so, you know, if you've ever tried to give up smoking or if you've ever tried to get rid of any habit, you know, mine, I'll put my hand up here, sugar. Oh, man, I am a sweet tooth. Oh, that is a hard one for me to give up. But, you know, I know I'm better off without it. There are no really good reasons for me to have a huge sugar content in my diet. And I'm a smart guy. So I can decide that I own this thing rather than it owning me. But the anxiety habit, it's going to want to come back. So we need to replace it with some other habits, don't we? And there are three major habits that we're going to start replacing the anxiety with. The first one is gratitude. Gratitude. There are so many things in your life that we can all be grateful for, that you can be grateful for. The fact that you're sitting here right now breathing, that's pretty cool. But I want you to be very specific. I want you to look down at the pants you're wearing to say, wow, these are nice pants. I remember buying them. I remember them pulling out of my closet this morning and they were clean when I put them on. I'm pretty, you know, that's pretty cool that there are some people that don't have that. I want you to be grateful for everything that you've got. Grateful for the roof over your head. Grateful for the food that you eat. Grateful for the job you've got or grateful for the opportunity to learn how to get a new job. I want you to fill your mind with gratitude. A lot of people talk about gratitude and it's so important because what happens is when you are filled with gratitude, there is no room for anxiety inside your head, none whatsoever. And so when we practice gratitude, so I want you to wake up every morning and think about five things that you're grateful for and not just the air that I breathe, something specific in your life that's only yours. What are you grateful for? That's the first habit we're going to replace it with. The second habit that we're going to replace it with is something we call purpose. I want you to replace it with purpose. What does that mean? Well, purpose is your why. 
Why are you here? I heard it said one time that the two most important days of your life is number one, the day you're born, and number two, the day you figure out why. What are you here to do? And when you discover your why, when you discover your purpose, your mission, what it is that you're passionate about accomplishing, you are so focused on that, on accomplishing that thing, you wake up every morning, can't wait to get at it. You're so focused on that, again, there's no room in your mind for anxiety. Now, your why doesn't have to be huge, massive, you know, like a Bill Gates or a Steve Jobs of the world. They've got, you know, they've got massive whys, and God bless them, that's great, we're all better off as a result. Yours doesn't have to be earth-changing, but it needs to be yours, authentically yours. Whatever it is, if it's gardening, if it's woodworking, if it's um, becoming a fantastic skier, whatever it is, it doesn't matter. If it's yours and it's your passion, then that will fill you with that. Your mind will be filled with it so much you will have no room for anxiety. And the third habit that we're going to replace it with is what I call instant action. Instant action. Because remember stepping off the curb in front of the bus and we said, oh man, we're going to hit by the bus. What did you do? Well, you took action. You didn't stand there thinking, hmm, what should I do? I really wish this bus wasn't coming at me. I hope it doesn't hurt me. No, you got out of there real quick, didn't you? And with anxiety, it's exactly the same thing. Because if you're perceiving a threat, part of gaining control is taking action against that threat. So if it's 2 o'clock in the morning and you're lying there awake and you can't sleep and your mind is going around and around and around with this thing that you're worried about, stop trying to go back to sleep. Get up. Go sit down. Take a, you know, a journal and, and write down and say, all right, here it is. It's 2 o'clock in the morning. What is one thing I can do right now in the next 10 minutes that will help me deal with this problem that I'm worrying about? or that I'm potentially worrying about, this potential problem. What can I do? Well, let's say I'm worried about my health. All right, I can go online right now, and I can join a health club. And I will start tomorrow. All right, very cool, you took something. And doesn't that feel better? Because you've now taken action. You gain control, and this is a guy thing, taking control, isn't it? And so this instant action habit should play right into all our masculine stereotypes. Let's embrace this action thing. We're men of action. So do something about it. Instead of sitting there worrying about it, do something. What's one thing you can do in the next five minutes? And then what's, something, what's three things I can do in the next 24 hours about this problem? All right. Now you can either discover that here's some things I can do about it, or you can say, there is absolutely nothing that I can do about this in the next 24 hours. Great. So then why are you worrying? What's it accomplishing? Great. I'm being duped again. I'm being convinced that I'm supposed to worry. How about we just drop it, shall we? That's how we do it. So we want these three major new habits are going to replace the worry habit. And the first one, remember, gratitude. Constant situation, constant a uh, state of mental and emotional gratitude. Constantly reminding yourself of all the amazing things that are going on in your life. And that gratitude can be, remember the little uh, success exercise we did a little while ago? You can be grateful for all the victories you've, you've scored in your life so far. And all the victories you've yet to win. Because there's a lot more coming. Right now, all you can think of is this one thing, but... Let's be grateful for all the other ones, and suddenly that one, the one that's focused on now doesn't seem so big. The second habit, replace it with purpose. Why are you here? What can you be working on that is going to improve you, improve the people in your life, improve the world in some way? Maybe your mission is to be the best dad ever. You know, It's wonderful, and the world needs a whole bunch of really, really good dads. Maybe that can be your mission, the passion that you feel. And then the final one, instant action. What can I do right now in the next five minutes to help make this problem go away? Because now I'm the one that's in control. I took control over this tension that's in my body and I took it out of there. Now I'm the one that's taking control over action. And boy, oh boy, that feels a whole lot better then, doesn't it? Now. We are getting down to uh, the end of our 90 minutes. I promised you 90 minutes and no more. 
Um, but I want to ask you a question. Uh, you know, we've, we've talked about it, and we've, uh, the anxiety, masculine anxiety. We started out by saying that sounds like an oxymoron, masculine anxiety. No, men aren't anxious. Well, turns out they are about a whole lot of things. We're just not supposed to talk about it. And we've been duped by this um, socialization, by these social stereotypes. And I don't even know where they came from, but boy, oh boy, they're not serving us. They don't serve me, so I let them go. You know, I will tell you right here in front of the entire world that I love rom-com movies. I love feel-good movies, and I bawl my eyes out. You know, anything that Pixar's got and all those cute characters and the happy endings, I'm just waterworks right here. And I don't mind saying so. I really don't. Because there's no downside to it, you know? And if there's some guys out there that think, ah, oh, what a sissy, then those are not guys I care to have in my life. You know, what they think of me is none of my business. I like the way I am right now. And I do not have any anxiety in me. And I want to ask you this question, and that is, if you find that you're feeling anxious, and I've given you a, just a tiny taste of it here about how we can get rid of that and how we can deal with it, and I am you know, evidence that says it is entirely possible to live a worry-free life. And oh man, it feels good. I wake up every morning and I think, wow, bring it on. This is going to be a fantastic day. And I fall asleep every night and it takes me about two minutes or less to fall asleep because I'm falling asleep thinking that was a great day and I can't wait for tomorrow to do have some more fun. It feels that good. Now, trust me, I know all about anxiety. In 2009, I worried myself into homelessness. I kid you not, I spent the month of August of 2009 living in my car. Why? Because I worried myself to there. And I decided that was ridiculous. I want to be out of this. And so I spent the, the intervening years learning and studying everything that there is to know about it. And I would love to help you overcome your masculine anxiety. And so what I'd be offering, what, what I'd encourage you to do, if you go on our website, i-fearless.com, www.i-fearless.com, right there on the, on the home page is a little box and it says, book your free call with David. And I would love to talk to you. And whether you're a guy who's feeling anxious or whether you're a, a partner of a guy and concerned about a guy and saying, what will he do? absolutely free, 30 minutes, no obligations, no credit cards, no nothing. I would love, because my mission, my why, is to rid the world of anxiety. The world is not a better place because of anxiety. The world is a worse place, and we're witnessing it right now in our streets. All that stuff, that's all fear-driven. Every bit of that that's going on out there right now is all about fear and anxiety. You know, we have this fear of the other, people that aren't like me, people that don't look like me, don't dress like me, don't come from the same side of a border that I live on. It just ruins us. So I would encourage anybody, if you want a little bit of help, book a call with me. You can go on there, you click on there, you can see all the times I'm available, you can book a 30-minute call absolutely free. I would love, 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 love to help you deal with this. And so, but with that, you know, and, and obviously we've got, uh, we had 90 minutes, very, very quick, and we had to skim over a lot of the stuff. There's a lot more to it. Uh, my book is, I, I don't know, I think it's 250 or 300 pages or something like that. Uh, we also have a, uh, an online course called Unsubscribe from Anxiety. It's a six-week course that walks you through, and there's a whole bunch of exercises that go mar much more deeply than we're, we were able to here tonight. But I would love to help you. That is my why as to why I get up every day. I get up every day to help people like you and people who suffer from anxiety or people that are like people that you know we don't need to suffer from this. It's the worst feeling. It's one of the worst emotions that we can have, and it's absolutely unneeded. We've been convinced, we've been duped into thinking that we're supposed to, and man, we've been double duped. You've been duped that you've been supposed to be anxious, and then on top of it, you're supposed to, you've been duped into thinking 
that you're not supposed to talk about it. And where's that getting us, guys? It's getting us three and a half to four times the suicide rates. It's getting us two to three times the alcohol abuse rates. It's getting us twice the drug abuse rates. It's getting us as 97% of, of the people who instigate domestic violence. And even if it's not those horrible, horrible things, it just feels awful and it makes us sick. Thank you so much for your time here today. I hope you got an awful lot out of it. I really enjoyed talking with you and I'd love to hear from you. Go on the website, connect, and let's talk some more. Thank you so much. I'll see you again on another program very soon. Mm -hmm.